All right. Well, good morning. As you can see, we're, we're uh, ready to begin. We have quite a distinguished panel. Um, I, it's my job to welcome you, which I'm delighted to do. It's so good to see uh, all of you here this morning for another one of our Scrivener Policy Roundtables. Um, you know, some of you have been to these before, uh, but for those of you who have not been involved, we have these conversations here um, uh, about pressing issues facing the state of Colorado. Uh, and this morning's topic, as uh, I was saying to somebody, is probably the quietly the most contra you know you know most uh, important uh, uh, issue on the ballot, uh, maybe for many years. I think people don't understand probably yet what this is. Most voters, um, uh, and yet what we know is that this has the potential, at least, to make a significant difference in the political dynamics in in Colorado. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, it was a, it's something that percolated in academic circles mostly for a long time, but as you all know, in this context of high polarization, has become a uh, possible solution, structural solution to the, the problems that face us. So I very much look forward to the com conversation today. Um, uh, the first part, I guess, is, is recorded, and then we have roundtable discussions that are off the record so we can have real, real conversations. Uh, congratulations to Scrivener Institute, uh, Nazni Barma, who will speak in just a moment, Director Katie Aker, uh, and the whole team at Scrivener uh, who organized these, these events. We're really proud of them here at the school. I'm Fritz Mayer, the dean of the school. I don't think I introduced myself, but uh, I, 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 I'm speaking in this room so often, I always think everyone knows me. Anyway, it's my honor to be the, the dean of the Corbell School, where, uh, in, which houses the Scrivener Institute. Anyway. Um, Welcome, look forward to the conversation. And with that, I think I'm turning this over to Nas. Thanks. Thanks, Fritz, for that lovely introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's such a, a wonderful pleasure uh, to, to see you all here today. Um, at, as we begin, and especially in the spirit of a conversation about democratic voice and accountability uh, that we're going to have this morning, let me begin by acknowledging that the University of Denver campus sits on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people who have stewarded this land for generations, and we recognize and mourn their loss, as well as that of all the indigenous tribes and nations who call Colorado and the Rocky Mountain West home. We're so pleased to be here with you all uh, in person again for the seventh installment now of the Scrivener uh, Policy Roundtable now in its fourth year. We're especially delighted to welcome today's presenters who I'll introduce in, in, in just a minute. Um, welcome also to representatives from our other roundtable partners, MPP students uh, and faculty and other faculty across the University of Denver working on policy issues. We're especially glad to be joined by Doug Scrivener, uh, morning Doug, uh, whose generous endowment of the Scrivener Institute um, makes our work possible. Uh, a core mandate of the Scrivener Institute is to serve as an interdisciplinary hub uh, for conversations on policy, both on the DU campus and across uh, the local community. And this roundtable embodies uh, those objectives by foregrounding local policy issues, uh, as Fritz just said, with a particular emphasis on informed and evidence dialogue. Um, we found that our invitation-only format is conducive to really kind of frank discussions about a whole range of issues, and we're so excited today to focus our conversation uh, on Proposition 131, uh, a ballot uh, initiative that Coloradans are soon to vote on. I was joking with Katie Aker, who really is the, um, the um, chief organizer of this uh, whole event, that I'm not sure how I'm going to vote, so I've convened this whole <laughs> round table to help me figure that out. I'm only half joking about that, so thank you again for, for, for joining us. Um, um, a huge thank you to Katie uh, for, for all the work that you've put in uh, into this particular installment and into the roundtable uh, in particular. To Landon Mascarenas, our colleague uh, um, who um, uh, runs Democracy and Civil Discourse Initiatives here at Corbell, and to our research assistant, Derek Quintero Rosa, who um, provided a fantastic background briefer, uh, again, for me uh, as an ig ignorant layperson on this topic. Um, as Fritz said, we're going to record the first portion of this uh, presentation. We've had a number of people um, who have uh, you know, asked us if we're going to, and they're looking forward to viewing um, uh, that video. Once we turn to the uh, group conversations at the tables, we will turn off the recording, uh, again, in the interest of having just a frank uh, uh, conversation. Uh, I want to just do quickly, I'm going to introduce the panelists in just a minute. Um, 
want to point to the uh, screen behind me, which has a QR code on it, and at the top, in very small um, writing for my old eyes, um, a, a Mentimeter, which is a, a, a tool to, to uh, measure how people are feeling about uh, uh, the ballot proposition. Uh, if you're so inclined, uh, uh, open up your phone and uh, go to the QR code or go to that menti.com and use the code that's up there at the top of the screen um, and answer the very uh, uh, brief questions that we have for you. We're going to take a sort of feeling thermometer at the beginning of the event here and then another one at the end to see how people, you know, whether people's minds were changed at all um, uh, or um, if, the, if their kind of uh, positions have been um, uh, cemented. Uh, so again, enormous thanks to all our presenters today. I'm going to read quick bios. You can find bios of, of all these wonderful folks online if you'd like more detail. On the far left, we have Molly Fitzpatrick, uh, who is the Boulder County Clerk and Recorder. Uh, Molly serves also as the president of the Colorado County Clerks Association. She previously served as the association's uh, elections uh, legislative co-chair, collaborating closely with county clerks and stakeholders to implement forward-thinking election reforms, prioritizing security and accessibility in elections. Um, Immediately to her right is uh, Representative Javier Mabry, uh, Colorado State Representative for District 1. Javier is an eviction defense lawyer and he represents the Southwest, Southwest Denver in the Colorado State House. He's represented over 300 families facing eviction and helped found Community Economic Defense Project in 2020, which has grown into one of the largest anti-poverty organizations in the state. To my immediate left um, is Amber McReynolds, who is currently Vice Chairman of the U.S. Postal Service Board of Governors. Previously, Amber served as Denver's Director of Elections from 2011 to 2018, where she led the transition uh, to a fully vote by mail system. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Uh, Amber is a leading expert on election administration and policy. Her professional career has been focused on strengthening democratic institutions with a goal of improving the voting experience for all. To Amber's left is Nick Troiano, the executive director of Unite America. Nick is a civic entrepreneur based in Denver. He is the executive director of Unite America, I just said that, apologies, a national organization that works to bridge the growing partisan divide by enacting political reforms and electing candidates who put people over party. And finally, in the middle, Chase Woodruff, senior reporter uh, for Colorado Newsline. Chase is a writer based in Colorado where he covers climate change, the environment, right-wing extremism, labor issues, and money in politics. Chase reports on environmental and economic policy for Colorado Newsline. And I was telling Chase just a few minutes ago that one of the first introductions I had to uh, the, the ballot proposition uh, before us was a, a podcast that he did back in May, June uh, with CityCast Denver, which was a fantastic kind of deep dive into this. And that's kind of what got my interest at least peaked, uh, knowing that the initiative was coming. So thank you all so much for being here th uh, this morning. Okay. We have kind of a, you know, uh, kind of quick fire format, but I'm going to address a specific question to each of our panelists and then sort of see who else wants to get in on that particular uh, piece of the conversation. I'm going to start with Nick. Um, Unite America supports nonpartisan electoral reform uh, around the country, and this is a, a live issue in many states in the country right now. So Nick, it would be wonderful to have from you a sense of uh, an overview of what's happening nationally with these reforms and why so many states have ventured down the path in the sense of what problem is this set of reforms trying to to solve. Wonderful. Well, thank you for hosting this forum. From the look at the screen, it looks like there are a lot of undecided voters in the audience, Perfect. so good timing, and uh, honored to be up here uh, with some very talented fellow panelists. Uh, so I do run an organization called Young America. We work on election reform nationally, but we're headquartered here in Denver, and it's very exciting for us because this proposition is right in our backyard. Uh, but I'll kick things off just by sharing a bit of a perspective of what's happening in the national landscape and also some perspective on the sort of problem solution that uh, this reform aims to address. Uh, what we're seeing here in 2024 are six initiatives across the country, uh, many Mountain West states that are pursuing open all candidate primaries, uh, which means dispensing with the bifurcated system of red and blue ballots and, and moving to red, white, and blue ballots as I described them with uh, all candidates listed on one ballot, every voter gets to participate, vote for whomever they want. Six states pursuing that. It's the most states pursuing some kind of election reform than we've seen in over a century. Uh, you have to go back to the progressive era, another time of rising uh, income inequality, uh, perception of corruption in government, et cetera. And back then, 100 years ago, by the way, that's when primaries were invented in the first place. Uh, there was a period of democratic innovation and renewal the secret ballot, direct election of senators, women's suffrage. So we are now experiencing in our own time a new chapter of democratic renewal. Why is that? 
Well, one is because there's an increase in dissatisfaction and disillusionment with politics today. Uh, people don't think government is serving the interests of the broad majority. Uh, and second is because a couple states have begun to experiment with reforms that have actually demonstrated uh, success and impact. Uh, Maine, the first state to adopt ranked choice voting in 2016, and Alaska, the first state to adopt top four elections, such as Prop 131, uh, in 2020. And those early proofs of concept, I think, combined with the growing dissatisfaction with politics is giving rise to this new, I think, uh, election reform movement, which we're seeing right here in Colorado. So what's the problem that these reforms are trying to solve? The best way to illustrate that is just to give you two data points. We're sitting here uh, a month out from the November election, and the sad news is most elections are already over. Uh, if you look at Congress, 87% of US House seats have already been effectively decided in party primaries earlier this year. That's because those districts are so lopsided for one party or another that the primary is the only election that really matters. Only 7% of Americans participated in the primaries that decided those elections. So you have 7% of voters electing 87% of Congress. Those same dynamics are playing out here in Colorado. When you look at the state house, the numbers are slightly worse in, in one respect. You have 84% of state house seats already decided in primaries back in June but only 4% of voters in Colorado. So if you ever wonder, well, why doesn't it seem like our democratic institutions represent us? Why can't they take action on the issues that 70 or even 80% of Americans agree on? Because they don't. Uh, most of Americans aren't participating in elections that truly matter. That's what it, uh, we describe as the primary problem in our politics. Uh, the solution we're gonna talk a lot more about today, or the potential solution, I know Amber will get more into the policy details, but. We advocate for two basic principles in the way that we approach fixing that problem. Uh, the first principle is that every American ought to be able to vote for any candidate in every taxpayer-funded election, period. Second principle is that whoever wins those elections should be required to earn majority support. And those principles are supported by 70 plus percent of Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Unfortunately, most elections today in our country don't adhere to either or both. Uh, Prop 131 uh, would get us there. What do we know about how this works? <clears throat> That's what I'll wrap on. The proof of concept. Alaska was the first state to adopt this uh, system in, in 2020. And what we saw was, uh, first, it was implemented well. It's actually one of the hardest states that you can implement a new voting system. A significant amount of polling locations aren't even connected by road. They have to literally fly sort of um, hard drives uh, back to the central location. 11 different languages because of how many different um, languages the native population there speaks. And still, despite all that, it was implemented successfully. 99.9% .9 of ballots were cast accurately, which means people figured out how to vote for their favorite and then in the general ranked their choices. A second, while we found that it, there was no correlation yet to be discerned on turnout in terms of like did more people participate, what was true was that there was a nearly 60% increase in the number of voters that cast a ballot that mattered. And what I mean by that is that you're casting a ballot in a competitive election that isn't predetermined by party affiliation alone, nearly 60% increase. Uh, and lastly, we saw from the election outcomes in 2022, uh, the same statewide electorate uh, elect a moderate Democrat to US House, a moderate Republican to US Senate, and reelect a conservative governor, which is all to say that when you give more power to voters to make decisions about who they want to represent them, they will pick the person, not just the party. And that's the potential that we have here in Colorado as well. Thank, thanks so much, Nick, for that for that really great overview. You hit on a couple of different things there, sort of a diagnosis of the problem, you know, the, the sort of assertion that you know that this set of reforms attempts to solve the problem uh, of, of people feeling that their vote actually matters, right? Um, I want to ask the, the the other panelists to, to kind of come in on this, and in, in terms of whether you uh, sort of how much you agree with uh, that characterization of the problem. Before we get into a little bit more detail on sort of what this ballot proposition is actually trying to attempt, Javier, I have a sense that you might want to get in on this. I do. Yes, uh, thank you uh, so much for hosting us. Uh, I am excited to have this conversation. Um, I agree that voters are dissatisfied with the political system and that voters feel that government is not responsive to their interest. That is absolutely the case. But I don't think the problem is the design of our elections. The problem, in my experience as an elected official, is money in politics. 
The Supreme Court decided that money is speech, first in 1976 in the Buckley v. Vallejo case, and then again in 2008 in the Citizens United case. And so what happens is local elections, elections for Congress, are completely flooded with corporate donations. And it is really hard if you are somebody like me who refuses corporate donations to compete in that environment. People-backed campaigns cannot win when they're flooded with corporate cash because voters are trying to get by in their lives. They're not really paying attention. And then when they get flooded by ad after ad after ad after ad that's coming from um, corporate-backed interests to gaslight voters into believing one candidate is better for them than the other, there, is, um, there are election results that end up with candidates not being responsive to the will um, of the voters. And um, I believe that our democracy is at stake right now, but I think money in politics is a big part of the reason why. I think politicians are more responsive to corporate donors than they are to people who are struggling to put food on the table and keep roofs over their head. Trust me, in the Colorado State Capitol, there is no anti-poverty lobby but the Chamber of Commerce is down there, and they're down there to tell us, hey, this regulation that you're putting in place that is going to increase wages for workers um, is bad for business. But people are dealing with the rising cost of living, right? They're telling us that the regulations that we're trying to put in place to deal with the rising cost of rent um, uh, are bad for corporate landlords. And those corporate landlords are able to donate endless amounts of cash into elections. And I believe that this solution makes the problem worse because it creates two different competitive elections for candidates like me. I will have to run in a competitive primary and then in Denver, yes, I do represent a safe seat. I was able to win, a comp I was able to win just by winning the primary. That is true. That means during the general election, I can go out and help Democrats win in Greeley and in Durango and I can focus on statewide wins for candidates that represent my values, right? Economic justice, a government that is focused on helping the poor. I believe deeply that the rise of Donald Trump has been enabled by the lack of responsiveness um, in government, right? People are frustrated. My generation is priced out of home ownership. And then what do we hear? I'm a Democrat, yes, but I will criticize the Democratic Party. What are we hearing right now? $50,000 tax credit to start a small business? I think the reason why we're hearing solutions like that is because candidates are afraid of pushing solutions that will alienate corporate donors. And I think that's why politicians are not responsive to the will of the people, and that's why politicians are not responsive to the conditions that are on the ground. And this will make it so politicians will have to raise money to win in two competitive elections when right now they're in safe seats. I think that increases the corporate influence um, of the lobby and will make people less responsive, will make politicians less responsive to the working class. Um, and so I agree that uh, people are dissatisfied with politics and I think that they should be dissatisfied with politics, but we disagree on the root of the problem. For me, the root of the problem is money in politics and if we're creating more competitive elections, that inherently increases the influence of money in politics. Thank you, Javier, and sort of a really interesting kind of point, counterpoint there in the sense that you, I think you both agree, as you as you said on this, or the nature of the problem, dissatisfaction, a sense that sort of votes don't translate necessarily into, into voter preferences, but for our public policy students who are here, two different sets of hypotheses about why that problem exists, right? Uh, with different evidence that would uh, support those uh, different hypotheses. One of our students is writing her capstone uh, uh, project on this on this particular topic. Amber, you're, you're, you're not only uh, uh, the, 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 you know, responsible for the, for the Denver electoral system that we have here, but you're a global elections expert as well. Um, would love to hear you reflect on anything you've heard Ready, but also help us understand a little bit more about what is really in this uh, uh, ballot measure. One thing that I find myself uh, confused about, I'm a, I'm a political scientist, I'm a public policy uh, scholar. Uh, there's two different things going on in this ballot proposition and that, that's confusing to me as a citizen. So anything you'd like to say about that? Yeah, well, um, first, thank you for hosting this and, and, and moderating this panel on this important topic and, and thank you to University of Denver for uh, always bringing to light really important issues on democracy. Um, 
first, I, I did serve as the director of elections for Denver for 13 years, as an election official for 13 years, and helped craft and design the voting access model that has made Colorado one of the top states for turnout, for engagement, uh, for, for voter access in the country, second, second highest in turnout, uh, for general elections. Um, I've also been an unaffiliated elector since I registered to vote uh, throughout my entire life. And for a while in Colorado, I actually was running elections for, you know, spending 48 hours at the office around election day, continuously making sure that results were posted, and I couldn't vote in those primaries because I was disenfranchised because the system was designed for only those that have a party label. So as I look at this, I look at this as the, from the lens of an election official, but also from the lens of a voter who hasn't been able to access the process um, and was told that, well, you just have to affiliate and then you can, you can get your right mm -hmm. to vote. And when we look at the data, the data is very clear about what voters think about making decisions based on party labels. About half the country now consider themselves to be unaffiliated or independent. In this state alone, 48.5% of voters right now are unaffiliated. 10 years ago, we were a third, a third, a third state. And so when we look at just the pure data of what voters are telling us, that to me is the most important uh, argument for considering change to ensure fair representation for all. And as I, as I look at and the work I did on the, on the voting access model here, you know, in my view, there's two ways to improve the voting experience for every single American, and that's what I've dedicated my entire career to doing. First, it's designing the correct voter access system. We did that here. We modernized voter registration. We automated the voter registration process, created same-day registration, tore down all the barriers around registration. Then we modernized the, the voting process. We, we, we responded to the fact that most Coloradans were asking to have a mail ballot sent to them. That was the voters telling us a story about what they wanted. And then we modernized the in-person experience. So we kind of did this whole voter access overhaul. That's actual, an actual overhaul happened 11 years ago to respond to what the voters were telling us. The second piece of the voting experience that is so important is fair representation. And if you look around the country, Nick mentioned the congressional seats that are safe. Most of that has to do with gerrymandering. And if you look at the, the uh, congressional members that voted to overturn the will of the people in 2020, most of them reside in deeply safe seats and have zero competition in their primaries and zero competition in the general election. If that isn't one of the, I think, starkest examples of the lack of accountability uh, with regards to especially Congress and overturning the will of the voters, I can't think of a metric that is. And so fair representation includes the way the districts are drawn, and we passed a ballot measure, again, another ballot measure that was in front of voters, to create an independent process. That made improvements, it made improvements, but the second piece of representation then is what the voters see on their ballot and what kind of competitive races they see and, and how, how, how they feel represented on the ballot itself. And that's what this ballot measure is about. It is about representation. It's not touching a single thing or changing a single thing about our incredible voter access model. It is, it is addressing the second core principle of, a, of, a, of an exceptional voting experience, and that is creating a better representation environment for voters that are unaffiliated, voters that are Republicans, voters that are Democrats, and every other minor party. Right now in Colorado, we have three different ballot access processes. So the major parties have their process. They have a caucus and a convention, and then they can also uh, circulate signatures to get on the primary. Unaffiliated voters get to jump over the primary and go right to the general election with signatures. And then minor parties have a super tiny uh, convention process, and they get to go right to the general election. So we end up with these huge swaths of people running for governor or Senate or all these things, and they never even see the vast majority of the voters prior to jumping to the general election. This initiative basically says everyone has to go through step one, and if you make it through step one, you, you get to step two. 
And so we've created, essentially designed, a fair process for every candidate. If you want to be paid by the taxpayers of Colorado to represent your district, you have to go through step one. And yes, you might have to talk to more people to make it through step one. You also might have to talk to more people and reach out to more people in step two. But that's a good thing for, for voters. Um, and the second piece of the uh, general election, so because we're advancing for people, uh, and this is an important aspect, and this is why these two initiatives are tied together, to your point, is majority support. And so the way we do that is to, to allow you now, instead of just one mark for one person, you now can rank them. And you can go up to four. You don't have to rank all of them. But you can go up to four by saying, this is my first choice, this is my second choice. You only want to do two, you can stop. You don't have to go all the way to four. Um, but it gives you more choice, and it gives you an ability to reflect your opinions about everyone running for office on your ballot in a, in a more fair and, and representative way. Thank you so much, Amber, for, for both separating out those two different elements of Prop 131, the open primaries, and then the uh, the ranked choice voting component, but also linking them. That that absolutely made a ton of sense to me. Molly, I want to turn to you, if I may. Um, you know, I think a lot of the conversation that we've had so far about fairness and about uh, sort of unaffiliated voters um, having access and uh, representation and so on, to me, that sort of speaks uh, more to the um, open primary kind of dimension of this. In Boulder last year, you uh, implemented um, uh, a ranked choice voting uh, system for mayoral elections. And so I wanted to kind of focus on that for, for, for just a, a little bit. Um, as the Boulder County Clerk, it would be great to have your insight in terms of how uh, that reform was implemented from a practical and logistical perspective um, and, and your sense of how uh, Boulder voters kind of uh, reacted to it. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, Molly Fitzpatrick, Boulder County Clerk and Recorder, and I'm also president of the Colorado County Clerks Association. So I think about these questions um, through the Boulder County experience and also through the experience of our smaller, more rural counties across the state. And yes, in 2020, um, the voters in the city of Boulder elected to um, uh, elect their mayor using ranked choice voting for the first time. So we knew in 2020 that we would be doing ranked choice voting in 2023. Um, I am the only election official in the state of Colorado to conduct ranked choice voting on a modern voting system. There have been smaller counties across the state that have done it, but they've done it on um, more of a hand count level because they've been so small. So um, we really did pioneer a lot of the process and the technology for how this could work. Um, what I would say is that it was a significant undertaking. And I would say that I have one of the best resource counties in the entire state. I have over a dozen staff. We have a long-term, a long-standing uh, relationship with a technology company in the city of Boulder that helps develop systems that don't exist. And, um, you know, we are proud of what we did. And we also look back on it and we're, think about how much work it was. Um, so to be really clear, we do not have a position. I do not. The association does not have a position on the merits of ranked choice voting. We will leave that for the researchers and we'll leave that to the voters and we'll leave that to the political folks to, you know, weigh in on the should we. Um, our concern is about implementation. Um, I think across the state, clerks are feeling um, concerned. Uh, I, you know, I look back at this and I wish that we had been able to weigh in on some of the way that this was written because there are requirements that need to be put in place in order for this to be successful. Um, Boulder County was able to, because we were the only county um, and because there was a lack of um, significant rules to govern how ranked choice voting works, we were in the driver's seat this whole, pro this whole time. We were calling our own shots, making our own policy decisions because policy decisions need to be made. Um, they don't exist now. Everything from how voters adjudica adjudicate their ballot to how you re release results, um, how you, just on and on and on, um, how you lay out a ballot. You know, we were making all these decisions along the way. Typically there's state guidance for that. And so, for us, you know, or for me, I think about the uniformity of how elections run in the state of Colorado. And it's important that we all have a similar set of standards that we operate under. And so for us, I think the concern is there's unanswered questions that I think, you know, the response has been, we'll get it sorted out in legislative session. And the 
you know, county clerks do better when we operate on absolutes. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, I think there's a lot of questions about, you know, the governing structure, the technology that doesn't exist, as well as um, who pays for it. Right. Let me just follow up with one quick question. Um, you know, you mentioned concern. I mean, I think there is also a concern, as we've seen in the in the last few years, a sense that county clerks are, are facing the the brunt of voter dissatisfaction in terms of sort of actually kind of the elect. You know, they're they're going to the polls, um, and um, I'm I'm curious to know whether in your position uh, uh, at, the, at the Colorado Clerks Association, if there's if there's actual fear on the part of county clerks um, in terms of your security uh, and and so on as as voters are kind of expressing uh, this frustration? There are county clerks across the state, especially in our smaller, more rural counties, are defending our current election system. And it's no one's really coming after us right now, I would say, about this question. I think the question is, you know, um, I don't vote on a paper ballot. <laughs> You know, and it's, yes, you do. <laughs> um, I don't understand the tabulation process. Come to our risk limiting audit. You know, there are conspiracy theories uh, that are in our state and they are alive and well and our counties are under attack. And, you know, we have boards of county commissioners that are conspiring to remove the local elected official from their duty. Uh, we have county clerks that have put up bulletproof glass. And, you know, we know that whatever happens after this election is going to be worse than it was in 2020. There is no doubt in my mind about that. 2021 was awful for us after the election. And 2025, we're anticipating is going to be just as bad. Um, so yeah, clerks are struggling right now. And, you know, I think the thing that we, again, want is some absolutes. And that's what I wish had been written into this language is, you know, there's these requirements that need to be put in place before the state can do this um, as, as a statewide initiative. Thank you. Um, thanks for, for, for your honesty there. The word that I was uh, struggling for was uh, you're on the front lines of this and appreciate your perspective on that. Chase, I'm going to come to you and then we'll come back uh, down the line so that everybody can uh, have another crack um, at the conversation. Um, you've been reporting uh, about this uh, for quite some time. Um, and so I'm curious to hear, you know, we've sort of kind of put a set of assertions up here about kind of how people are feeling. You've actually been kind of talking to people around the state of Colorado. Uh, and I guess um, I would love to hear from you sort of what your the sentiment is that you're uh, reporting on. Um, and sort of um, to the extent that you're getting the view from uh, Colorado voters, what are their arguments on both sides of this? Yeah, I, I think in general, um, we're in the middle of a very heated presidential election at the moment, if you haven't noticed. I think um, that, you know, awareness of this uh, proposition, I would say, is, is a little lower than it might be otherwise. Um, you mentioned the confusion. I think um, one of the things that I've noticed and tracked throughout the year and, and I think is, has been incumbent on those of us in the media to kind of educate folks is I, I, I do think people gravitate towards thinking about this as a ranked choice voting proposal. Mm -hmm. if, you know, it's natural to kind of, um, this is a, a pretty broad elect election reform measure with two major things going on as you talked about. Um, and it's, it's uh, at least the sense that I've gotten is that folks are more focused on the ranked choice voting um, because that is maybe something they're more familiar with. Um, that is, you know, something that they expect will change elections a lot more than the other component. I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean, I think they're both pretty significant um, changes as, as far as the top four all candidate primary uh, system goes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the 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 uh, poll right now. Obviously, this is a very small sample. We haven't seen a ton of um, public polling. Uh, the polls that we have seen look pretty good for the Yes campaign. Um, I know that the the Yes campaign put out a poll within the last couple of weeks that was uh, showed a very large lead. Um, there was an independent poll I think released this morning that also showed um, the measure ahead with a little bit more, as we see here, uh, folks who are undecided. Um, and one of the things that is uh, a very clear finding from, from both of those polls that is interesting to me is that, um, you know, at least in Colorado, this is much more popular with Democrats and unaffiliateds than it is with Republicans. Um, that's an interesting to think, uh, thing to keep an eye on going forward because, you know, one of the ways to think about this is, you know, just to state the obvious, there needs to be a majority political coalition to pass these measures. Um, and there also needs to be that, that, that coalition needs to, you know, survive in a sense to sustain these changes. We talked about Alaska. Um, there's a repeal effort in Alaska this year. There are a lot of folks, um, you know, we, we talk about 
disaffection and alienation from the political system, it is, it's maybe not easy, but it's easier to come to folks with a new system and say, hey, you're disaffected from what the political outcomes we're seeing are, let's try this new system. And you know, as, as we saw in Alaska, it was very close, but they, they went for it. Um, is that political coalition that passed that going to sustain it this year? We'll see. Um, that's that's a, something to keep an eye on, and as United America targets many other states to, uh, to pass this reform. Thanks so much, Chase. Um, I really appreciate that um, you, you're kind of drawing this, the distinction in terms of where support comes from in terms of affiliated voters. Nick, I'm going to come back to you on the Alaska question in just a minute. But I want to turn uh, to Javier. Um, this, you know, I didn't realize um, that um, de de uh, Democratic voters are, seem to be more in favor of this measure. The, both, both the parties have come out uh, against this, of course, and, and that sort of makes sense. Javier, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, the parties have come out against it, but major uh, elected uh, officials uh, Jared Polis, uh, uh, Senator Hickenlooper, um, you know, uh, Mike Johnson, our, our mayor, have all come out in the last couple of weeks in favor of this. So I'm curious to know, as an elected re representative yourself, what you see is happening here and kind of what's going on uh, with Democratic elected representatives and Democratic voters. Anything you can help us understand that sort of, um, you know, little seems to be some inconsistency there. Well. So the first thing I'd say is that I think that there's a lot in Prop 131. I think it's difficult to pull. Um, rank choice voting is one thing. Um, and then the open top four going into the general election is another thing. Um, and so uh, I think generally Democrats are in favor of electoral reforms. They hear this as an electoral reform. I don't think that voters are necessarily totally um, on board with everything because I'm not sure that they know exactly what um, is in Prop 131. As far as a distinction between um, where the political party is and where candidates like me are versus the governor, Mike Johnson, et cetera, I mean, Governor Polis and Mike Johnston, I like them, I work with them a lot. We also disagree a lot, but they are the candidates who are more likely to be to benefit from a system that rewards money in politics. I mean, they raise, they're able to raise immense amount of money. Uh, Governor Polis spent 23 million of his own money to get elected. Um, I found that ironic during the pandemic because then when um, uh, we had an eviction crisis, he allocated 20 million in his budget for the eviction crisis. And I thought it was funny that he thought, um, you know, a race for governor is worth 23 million, but stopping an eviction crisis is worth 20 million. Um, so uh, I think that's the the big distinction there. And and to to illustrate this by way of example, uh, my friend Mike Weissman just won his primary, a very close primary in Aurora. He is a state senator. I work with Mike Weissman all the time, um, and Mike Weissman and I work on anti-poverty consumer protection legislation. Specifically, we've worked on stuff targeting debt collectors and payday lenders, preventing payday lenders from preying on uh, uh, the poorest Coloradans, making sure that in 2018, Colorado implemented a cap on what payday lenders could charge people for a payday loan. There were loopholes in the law that payday lenders were taking advantage of, and Weissman and I worked on legislation to close those loopholes. We also took on debt collectors so that they had to be transparent about um, where debt was coming from if they were suing people in court and so that they could not weaponize the court system to get warrants for people's arrest based on money that they owed. So what happened when Mike Weissman was running for his next election? It was flooded with money backing his opponent coming from payday lenders and debt collectors. And again, he barely won his primary. And in this system, what would happen is his candidate that was benefit, his opponent who was benefiting from the backing of the payday lenders and debt collectors would get a second bite at the apple. And those payday lenders and debt collectors could again spend millions against Mike Weissman in the general election when Mike Weissman wasn't taking corporate donations, relying on small grassroots donations, barely made it out of his primary. He's got to go back and ask people who are struggling to put food on the table for more money to compete against the payday lenders. And so what I think is happening where Governor Polis, former Governor Hickenlooper, current senator, 
Mike Johnston, why they're behind this is they don't see it as a problem for candidates like them to get elected because they're going to have that financial backing. That's never been a problem for them. That, thank you. That, again, really interesting kind of different diagnosis of what's really underlying the problem. Amber, I'm going to come to you on that in just a minute. So get, get ready. <laughs> uh, Nick, I would, I would like to ask you, you know, as, as um, I, I think Chase just mentioned, um, the state of Alaska voted uh, in favor of a ranked choice voting system. Uh, tried it, and now there's a proposition uh, to overturn it. So tell us what's going on there and kind of what, the, what that reaction is about. States with open primaries and issues on the ballot, there's a couple of states we're playing defense in, including in Alaska, where there is a repeal effort. Now you hear, oh, they're trying to repeal it. What went wrong? I actually think it's the opposite. It's sort of what went right in terms of it worked exceptionally well in giving a lot more voice choice and power to voters. And therefore, the political class and establishment that was swept out of office if they couldn't win majority elections last time have come back with a vengeance to try and take back that power. And I think the voters will ultimately prevail one way or another in Alaska. And that kind of gets at the whole point of what this initiative is, is about. Um, it will create more competitive elections, which does ask people running for office and serving in office to have to earn the votes of their constituency to get elected. That's not always a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing. Uh, there's a state senator named Kathy Giesel in Alaska. She was an opponent of this initiative when it was first uh, proposed. Uh, however, she lost her primary that same year in 2020. She was primaried by the, her ideological fringe for working with Democrats in the state legislature and was tossed out of office along with about a half dozen others. In 2022, she runs again under this system. And what she said was, when I was running in the primary, I no longer took the list my party gave me of which Republican primary voters' households to knock on their doors. I just knocked on every door. And then she went to the general election because she's one of the top four candidates. And when she knocked on every door again, she said, you know, uh, I'm Kathy Giesel. I appreciate your support. And the voter said, mm, I don't think I'm supporting you. She goes, well, that's OK, because you can rank me number two. She wound up getting reelected. And not only did she wound up getting reelected under the new system, she became the Senate majority leader, working with a bipartisan governing majority in the state legislature, a group of Democrats and Republicans who said, we're going to put some divisive issues aside and work on what's good for Alaska. To me, that's a success story of asking our elected officials to do more under the system. The last point I'll make is that if you're concerned about money and politics, I am, you should want this system. And what I mean by that is the reason why special interests have so much leverage in the system is that it's a good bargain. In low turnout party primaries, when only about 4 to 8% of the electorate is voting, that's a pretty small group you can target with those TV ads and mailers and digital ads. When you actually have to win support from majority, it will dilute the power of special interests. And that's what our research has found. We've compared whether special interests under all candidate primary systems, which a couple states have, are more likely to get their candidates elected or not compared to closed primary systems. And when you open the elections process, it dilutes their influence. And that's another reason why I think uh, to support this measure. Thank you. Um, Amber, let me kind of pick up on, the, on this thread about, you know, the criticism that uh, um, ranked choice voting and open primaries kind of indeed empowers those with money um, in, in the system. And layer on top of it, my own kind of personal question about this, which is, um, you know, as Nick said at the outset, uh, the, the last major uh, reform, uh, it, the progressive era kind of introduced political parties to us. They've been a defining feature of our landscape. Uh, many Americans, I mean, you, you made the point about sort of how many unaffiliated voters there are, but party identification, we know from the political science literature, is very strong. So what does this mean for sort of parties in the United States? Um, and are we undermining uh, something that we're going to wish we didn't? Um, so a couple things on, on that point. Um, the parties, I, the way that I look at this is it's actually an opportunity for them to strengthen how they talk to voters and, and have conversations. This isn't changing the, the, the fact that a party could endorse a candidate. It's not changing their ability to get to the ballot either through the caucus or through the convention or with signatures. It's not changing any of that. But... In a scenario, and I'll just, I'll just throw out one scenario, we'll, we're in Denver, Congressional District 1. Whenever Congresswoman DeGette decides not to, be, not to run for that office anymore, there's probably going to be 35 people plus, maybe, that run for that primary. And the entire election is in the primary. 
And our primary that we just had in Colorado had 26% turnout. One in four voters in this room voted and participated. And when you look at Lauren Boebert's race, she got about slightly over 50,000 votes in a 504,000 person district. She got nine, nine, a little over 9% of the votes and she is now gonna be a congresswoman because I don't really, no matter what anyone says, that is a fairly safe seat. We can all agree on that. Same with Denver. You know, you, you, the fact that we would have this very low turnout primary determine who would represent for Congress Denver, uh, to me, is a, is, is a problem. Like, we should see the competition happen in the general election. And it might be in Denver that three Democrats advance and maybe one independent, or three Democrats and a Republican, or two, likely at least two Democrats advance, maybe three, maybe even four. And that's fine, because that's the will of the Denver voters, and now voters have a meaningful choice to say, what does this look like? And the party probably now hosts events and says, let's have both Democrats, or let's have all three Democrats, and instead of it being just a beat each other over the head and run against no one, essentially, which is kind of how the current system is, the parties are now going to have meaningful debate on policy issues and discussions and all those sorts of things. And so that's why, like, in my view, when I look at this as someone who's not a member of a party, I would much rather uh, see parties actually embrace more discussions on policy and debate and all of that as, uh, as some of this is put in front of the voters. And frankly, the system right now, like, I'll just compare it to if you're a business. If you're a business and half of your customers are no longer buying your product, choosing a label to put next to their name, you, you probably need to rethink how you're marketing and how you're encouraging people to come into the party. And that's the reality of, of both parties. They've lost a lot of uh, actual affiliation, participation. If you go to the, the party meetings on Saturdays, which I have presented to many of, it, it, it isn't a very diverse group of people in a lot of those meetings, um, but, but they've lost participation. And so if you're losing that kind of ground, you've got to do something different to bring people back in and bring people back into an engaging environment. And, you know, I think the, the Boebert race is a great example of, of this very low turnout choosing now someone that will be elected for that district for probably as long as she wants, given how secure and safe that seat is. And there's many of those all over the country. Um, and the final just quick point I'll make on party. So there are two remaining senators that voted for impeachment and have voted for accountability measures that are Republicans. One is from Maine and one is from Alaska, both places that have the, this reform, especially with the ranking and majority support. Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski are the only remaining Republicans that stood their ground. Everybody else has either retired or lost a primary because it was closed. They are the only remaining. And I think that that's actually a really good example of, of allowing you know, a party to do the right thing or hold people accountable or embrace a wider swath of voters to uh, try to win. Yeah. Super interesting and clarifying, thank you. I'm gonna ask two more quick questions up here and then we're gonna turn to our group uh, discussions. Uh, Molly, first to you. Um, you know, another thing that um, uh, I'm remembering from the recesses of my PhD uh, comprehensive exams um, is that, you know, voters wanna see their vote manifested, right? And one of the critiques of a, a ranked choice voting system as opposed to our kind of traditional first past the post system where the top, you know, the person who gets the most votes wins is that when you have a ranked choice voting system where uh, the person with the lowest numbers of votes is, is thrown out and then uh, their votes are kind of uh, reallocated, uh, this second and third ranked and so on, is that voters don't actually feel that the result reflects their vote. Does that uh, kind of um, jibe with your experience in, in, in Boulder in, in the last election? Uh, did people feel that, you know, did they didn't quite understand how, how you got to the person, the mayor that you did, or did it, did it seem the opposite, that actually people sort of saw this as a legitimate way to kind of elect a, a mayor? Sorry, that was a bit of a convoluted question. No, it's okay. You know, again, I think uh, I'm really proud of the work that we did to run that election. Um, I, it, and it took a lot of work to make sure that voters did understand 
the system. There are over a dozen new terms that will be introduced into the public if this uh, measure were to pass. Everything from, you know, rounds to active ballot, inactive ballot, elimination, uh, batch elimination, blanks exhausted ballots, overvote, duplicate ranking threshold, non-transferable total. Um, wow. You know, there there's a lot here. And our, we know that our voters in Colorado care very deeply about our election model. And we know that they need and want to understand how the process works. And so we spent significant amount of time and energy and money and including coordination with the city of Boulder to make sure that voters understood how their rankings worked, how the tabulation system worked. Um, and so my uh, request and concern is Who's going to do that education for these tiny little counties that have one staff member? This has to be a responsibility of the state. And, you know, we don't know, we don't have any sort of commitment on that front because to me it would, you know, my, my thinking is we would need to put the same amount of money into a voter education campaign that, you know, similar to how we did in 2018 for the unaffiliated voters participating in primaries for the first time, except this would need to be on steroids um, because it is more complicated, more complex. And, you know, we just need to make sure that voters get how that system works and how the tabulation works. That's where we're getting all the questions right yeah. now in today's model is, you know, I need to understand the tabulation. Can I open up your computers? Um, you know, I, again, I don't vote on paper. Um, show me my paper ballot as it compares to the cast. But, you know, all of these questions. So, you know, that's the work that needs to be done. And we did, you know, a lot of that in Boulder. But again, we had a really willing partner in the city of Boulder. We have a very engaged electorate. So I would want to see that requirement be placed on the state, um, as with the other requirements, you know, to develop the technology that to do a risk limiting audit, because that technology does not exist for um, this kind of reform. Uh, neither does uh, election night results reporting. Um, that's another thing, talking about transparency. Um, we did contract with a company to help you know, visually display how the results move through the various rounds, but that technology doesn't exist for the state. Um, we couldn't upload our ranked choice voting um, contest to the state site because it doesn't support it. Um, and then, you know, again, I think just general rulemaking would be another thing that the state needs to take on. Um, and again, I think the question for us is the timing. You know, we, uh, if this passes, the clerks will take the lead on the implementation legislation, absolutely, because we are going to do whatever it takes to make sure that this thing works well. So in an ideal, you know, on a very ambitious timeline under this current, the way it's currently written, you know, we pass a bill in May of next year in the 2025 session. Rulemaking typically happens over the summer. So in an, uh, an ideal, ambitious world, we get rulemaking that answers all of these policy questions that have not been answered. So we get that by September. Um, let's say that, uh, and, and with that rulemaking, you know, counties are going to have to update every process, every procedure. They're going to have to educate themselves, their staff, and their voters on these new policy questions. And then the state is going to need to develop the, you know, two technology systems that I see is lacking right now. Um, and, you know, it's not enough to say, snap your fingers, here's the technology, yeah. go. Uh, we were testing our technology up until two weeks before we did the risk limiting audit. We were still finding issues with our technology, you know, and that's part of the work that we do as election officials. We get a system, we test it, we test it, we test it, we test it. We train to it, we train to it, we train to it. We're doing dress rehearsal. So we need time with this new technology to make sure that it's gonna work for our staff and for the voters. Um, and so, you know, after that, again, the voter education campaign. So to, to us, I think it's a question of, of timing um, and making sure that everyone has time to set this up. Thanks so much. Really uh, clarifying from the implementation side. And Chase, I just want to wrap up our, our panel conversation at least by asking you uh, to reflect again sort of on the voter education kind of elements that, that Molly was bringing up. And in particular, whether you, uh, how you see sort of across the state, sort of front range, you know, densely populated cities, uh, more engaged kind of uh, urban electorates versus kind of other, um, you know, um, elect, uh, uh, kind of local electorates in, in Colorado. Are there kind of differences across Colorado in terms of how v voters are viewing this measure, the extent to which they know ab uh, about kind of the, the details that we're talking about here? Um, I can speak to the polling a little bit. The, the, I, th I, I think um, that was a finding in, in at least one of the polls that I've seen that, um, yeah, as you would expect, right, if uh, Democrats and unaffiliated who make up um, a greater share of the population in, in the, the metro area and along the front range 
um, I think that 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 finding holds that yeah we we um, we see that and and you know it it connects to something that Clerk Fitzpatrick was talking about you know rural counties may have a tougher time doing voter education about this yeah. kind of stuff and that's that's uh, certainly a question that will um, be relevant going forward uh, assuming this this system does pass. Thank you, Amber. You have the last word here. Um, well, I just wanted to add on the implementation questions, and I've done some work with various states and cities and jurisdictions that have done this around the country. The, the really great thing that's happened over the last five years or so is that there's actually significant resources that have been put into things like the design of ballot instructions and what ballots look like and research about how you best design a ranked choice ballot. In fact, Boulder, uh, actually, when Molly was implementing, and she emailed me and I sent her a number of different national resources and you know all of that kind of happened within that year. And so that, that aspect is really important. The other really important aspect is there's now open source reporting tools for election results that have been used in states like Alaska and Virginia and other, other implementations. Mm -hmm all available and, 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 and available to the public and in use right now. Um, and then the other final thing about Colorado, so 60 of the 64 counties currently have systems that have ranked choice, just like what Boulder used uh, in their system. And then the other few counties that use a different system, that system's actually been in federal testing since the beginning of this year with their RCV uh, rank model. So I say all that to, to you know, really highlight that Colorado as a state is far more advanced and ready because of all the work that the county clerks have done over time to select really good systems and, and make sure that uh, the systems that are in use here have actually been used elsewhere too. Alaska uses the same system that 60 of our counties use and reported results and all of that effectively. So I say all that because yes, the implementation is really, really important but there's also significant strides and steps that have been taken nationally to uh, fill some of these, these gaps. Yeah, thank you, and, and bringing us kind of back around, I appreciate that to the beginning of the panel and the fact that this is a national kind of set of reforms in, 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 in many ways, not sort of you know across all 50 states, but there's a, a large number. So we're gonna turn to a, a group conversation. I've, we've asked each of our uh, panelists to join one of the tables here. Um, we have at the tables a set of questions that you might consider taking up, but really your job is to grill the panelists uh, even more than I have. Uh, you've all been very kind in actually answering the questions that I asked you. I very much appreciate that.